Good morning. How many of you have been watching the uh, Winter Olympics? Just three or four of you, that's good. You know, the thing that I love most about the Olympics is how they light the torch in Athens and they run it all across the world before they light the torch at the Olympic Games. I think it just proves that it's hard to put out a grease fire. Right? Before I start this morning, I just want to say that if you've been around for a while or not, this week take a t- some time and thank Sean and Daniel for all the work that they're doing with our teenagers and our children. It is amazing to see the life in those programs and how much our kids are loving it. So if you have time this week, or if you don't, do it anyway. Take some time and thank them this week. Men, this series really is for you. But ladies, it's going to be great because it's going to teach men in your life how to be better men. Now, men, if you could agree with me just for a moment, we all know that there are two types of movies in this world, right? There are chick flicks, and then there are good movies. Right? That's right. But this one, guys, is for you. Because I think if we're really going to solve some of the problems in this world, in this country, it's going to take some men standing up and leading their families closer to Jesus. Leading them where they need to be. And I believe that God is going to do something amazing and radical in the lives of our men during this series. And what you need to know, men, is that within you, there is a potential for supernatural greatness. Inside each and every one of you, there is a potential for supernatural greatness. God has given you the ability to do great things, and ladies, you have that too. But men, if you make this conscious effort to be here over the next three weeks, I believe God is going to raise up leaders like never before before. And historically in the world, there have been a shortage of godly men, men willing to raise their families, men willing to accept the call. Let me open with what I believe is one of the most tragic verses in all of the Bible. Ezekiel twenty-two thirty says this, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it but I found no one. He found no one. So maybe if God were to say that he was looking for someone, if he was looking for that man of integrity, he would say, you know what? I found no men of courage. He would say, I searched all the land to look for some man that had courage and I found none. He would say, I was looking through all the land to find one man willing to lead his family in the direction that they were supposed to go, but I found none. I was looking for one man who was able to stand with integrity above everything else this world tells us is okay, but I found none. And I believe with all of my heart that if God were to look at this place for a man of integrity, he wouldn't find none, but he would find many. Many years ago, there was a man named Henry Varley, and he said to one of the greatest Christian evangelists of all modern times, D.L. Moodley, he said, the world has yet to see what God can do through one man's heart who has totally surrendered unto him. He said, the world has yet to see what can happen when there's one man totally surrendered to God, and D.L. Moodley said, What I hope some of you will say today, I will be that man. He said, let that be me. And today we're launching into a new series and we're going to study the life of Samson. And if you want to read ahead, I would encourage you to do that. We're going to be reading through Judges 13 and 16. But today I'm just going to kind of give you an overview for chapter 13. And a lot of us know a little bit about Samson. 
There's a lot of us that know a little, but I want you to know a lot. Because his accomplishments were legendary. But unfortunately, so were his failings. See, the things that Samson did, they're things of legend. People talk about him, how amazing of a man he was. But at the same time, he failed greater than some men could ever imagine. Everything he had was taken away. And what you need to know is that potential for greatness lives inside each and every one of you. But also that potential to fail lives inside each and every one of us. We make decisions every day that take us away from the potential that God has for us. And if you were to summarize his life in one statement, I think it would be this. Samson was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. He was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. And man, that's like so many of us. That's like so many of us. We're incredibly strong, but the desire, the will, the drive inside of us is very weak. See, as we're looking at Samson's story, what you need to realize is that Israelites had been unfaithful to God. They were under the Palestinian or the Philistine rule, and they said, you know what, I'm going to raise up a man to deliver you from bondage. And an angel appeared to a couple and said, you are going to conceive a son. And she gives birth to Samson. And the spirit of the Lord stirred within him from a very early age. God came upon him in supernatural ways. And in chapter 6, he said that I want you to live by the Nazarite vow. So what is that? What is the Nazarite vow? And it was a way that a non-priest could make vows to be set apart from God, to be set apart for God, for the work of God. He said, you know what? I'm going to set myself apart. Even though I'm not a priest, I'm going to set myself apart for the work of God. So what vows did you have to take? Well, the first vow was you had to take that you couldn't get drunk. So no Coronas, no margaritas, all that's beside us. And the second vow you had to take is that you wouldn't touch dead things. For some of us, it's like, that's easy. And the third thing is you couldn't cut your hair. And when we think about Samson, we think, well, I wonder what his hair looked like. And I guarantee you, even though it was long, it was not a mullet. Those have never been cool. But what's up with the hair? Why was he not allowed to cut his hair? And I believe it was because it was just like we saw last week in baptism. It was an outward sign of an inward change. It was an outward sign to allow people to know what was going on in his heart. And it's funny because I, I preached on this once to a group of teenagers when I was a youth pastor and I was preaching on the Nazarite vow and I said, you know what, what we need to do right now is some of us, let's take this Nazarite vow for the next 40 days. Well, with teenagers, it's really easy not to drink because most parents won't let you drink when you're 12 or 13 years old. It's just a smart thing to do. So what we did instead is we took this vow. We said, we're not going to play video games for 40 days, which was, that was tough. And we're not going to cut our hair. And we're not going to touch dead things. That's pretty easy, right? So for that entire time, we didn't cut our hair and we didn't play video games, which is amazing because in that time, it was one of the greatest outreaches that we could do as youth pastors. We were playing video games all night with these kids and it brought them to the youth group. And it was amazing to see the change in those young, those young people after that. To see what they had done, to see how it changed them as they set themselves apart for God for 40 days. But just like baptism, that was just an outward sign. And when God's strength would come upon him, it was an amazing thing to behold. When people would see God's strength, he had the strength of like 10,000 men. He could rip a lion apart. 
And yet with all of his God-given potential, his weak will got him in trouble time and time again. And we're going to watch as his weak will will get him in trouble for just a handful of honey. Everything that he had, all the power that he had, he gave it up for a handful of honey. And then we'll watch as his anger causes him to unrighteously kill 30 innocent men for just a bet that he had lost. And we'll watch again as he goes after the wrong kind of woman. Guys, he's just like us. He has so much potential. But again and again, he squanders it away for something dumb. And I don't know how many of you men are the, are the aggressive type. But there are so many men that they're so aggressive. They're type A leaders. They put everything in order. They go after what they want at work. They're the greatest men you could possibly imagine. They go after it and they get it. And they go home and they sit on the couch and there's no leadership there. The leader at the office is not the leader at home. They set everything aside. And I don't know how many men I know that will spend hours researching the best bow to buy to kill the biggest buck. The best tree stand to climb in a tree. The best rod and reel to catch the most fish. But find a hard time spending five minutes to get into the word. I know who men who love God, who love their wives, but are locked in a prison of lust and spend their free time when no one's around looking at pornography on the internet and are too afraid to ask for help. So much potential, but are self-destructing time and time again. So why do you think so many men fall apart? In the life of Samson, I think it shows us three attributes that make strong men weak. Those attributes are lust, entitlement, and pride. See, what lust is, is lust says, I want it. I want it. I want it. I got to have it. I love it. I'm going to take it. Man, we just say, I want it. And what happens is a man that wants something, he slips into this pattern, and all of a sudden, all logic goes out the window. I've got to have it. I've got to have it right now. I want it. I need it. I need it. I got to have it. I want it. And for some of us, it might be the woman. I've got to have her. For some of us, it's the hit. It's the drink. I've got to have it. I've got to have it right now. For some of us, it's the quick fix. I've got to get it. For some of us, it might be the advancement in our career. I've got to get there. I've got to take it. I've got to do whatever it takes. I want it. For some of us, it might be the boat. Or maybe it's the new house or the new iPhone and we see it and we want it and every ounce of logic is out the window. We can't even think straight. And we pursue it with reckless abandonment. And Judges 14, 1 and 2 says this. It says, Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a smoking hot young Philistine woman. I added that part. And when he returned, he said to his father and mother, I've seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. I want it. I want her. I've got to have it. Give it to me. So what did he do? He leaves his hometown and he traveled four miles to Timnah into enemy territory. He left his friends... He left the place where he was safe. 
and he went to hang out with his enemies. And he finds a forbidden woman because God tells us that we should keep our relationships the same, relationship with someone that only worships him. And at the moment he looks at her, he forgets everything else. And we can't say that that's crazy. And some of you, when you first met your wife, you felt that exact way. Every time you looked at her, you couldn't even remember what your name was. And this is where we find him. He sees her and he says, you know what? I don't care what you say, God. I don't care what you tell me I'm supposed to do, what I'm not supposed to do. I've got to have it. Mom, I don't care what you say. Dad, I don't care what you say. I want it. He says, I don't care how unwise it is. I'm a man. I do what I want. I want it. And over and over again, we can see that lust takes strong men and makes them weak. And the second attitude is entitlement. Not just I want it, but I deserve it. Oh, I deserve it. See, the spirit of entitlement, it doesn't just say that, that we, need, we want to have it, but it says, oh man, I, I deserve having it. I work hard. I've been slaving away. I deserve all of this. I deserve to have a few things. I deserve it. Some men in their marriage say, yeah, I deserve it. I live with that woman at home. I deserve whatever I can get here. I put up with her all the time. And we're going to watch as he gets this attitude. As he says, I deserve it. And he's going along one day, and a lion jumps out. See, some of you don't get really worked up about that because you've never seen a lion in the wild. You've never just came upon a lion, and I have. I was running one morning, and a mountain lion ran in front of me. This is no story. This is the truth. We were running. We were about half a mile from my house. It was early in the morning, me and a friend, and we're running, and this mountain lion just crosses the road in front of us. I stopped, and he stopped, and I looked at him, and I said, you saw that, right? And he was like, yes. So then there's this moment where you have to decide what you're going to do. Do you keep running or do you turn around and go home? Well, we just kept going because I had a dog with me and I just figured I could feed the dog to the mountain lion and I wouldn't have to worry about it unless she's faster than me and then I'm in trouble. But this is a big deal. This lion shows up in front of him and David kills the lion. He rips it apart. Or Samson kills the lion and he rips it apart. So later on, he comes across this lion, this carcass, and it's laying there. I don't know what he's going to do with it, but it says this in verse 8. It says, Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, this woman, he turned aside. And that's when we get ourselves in trouble. Men, if you want to know when you get yourself in trouble, it's when you turn aside. Like when you're following God and you're chasing after him and you know the way that you're supposed to go and you know who you're supposed to be with in your marriage and you're going forward, but all of a sudden you turn aside and see something else. Instead of looking at the way that you're supposed to go and knowing where you're supposed to be, you turn aside. And that's where you get into trouble when you're not following God, when you're not following the path that he has for you. And look what happens. He turns aside to look at the lion's carcass. And in it, he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. He scooped out the honey with his hands and ate as he went along. Look, that's gross. I mean, that's nasty. Men, we are nasty. I 
I mean, we're nasty. And if you don't believe me, just think of how a man determines if underwear is clean or not. Right? We're nasty. <laughs> Secondly, he was supposed to not touch dead things. But you find himself reaching in and pulling out the honey. So God gives him this power to rip this line apart. And later when he sees it, he says, you know what? I deserve it. I deserve some of that. I killed that lion. I deserve some of that. So instead of following the path that he had taken, the path that God wanted him to go, he turns aside to get this honey. And we think, man, that's so crazy. Who in their right mind would sell their life, would sell their God-given potential for honey? And the answer is, man, we do it every single day. It may not be honey. Maybe it's money. Maybe what God's called you to, you turn it away and you sell everything that he wants you to do for money. Or maybe you do it for gratification. I just got to have some more stuff. I got to be better than the people next door. Lust says, I want it. I want it. Entitlement says, I deserve it. And whenever it turns, comes to temptation, it turns to this third thing. It turns to pride. And men, you know what we say? Pride says, I can handle it. I can handle it. I've got this. I don't need any help. I'm strong. I don't need to call anybody. I've got this. So the three things were what? Don't cut your hair. Don't touch dead things. Don't get drunk. So what does he do in verse 10? Get this. It says, now his father went down to see the woman. And there Samson held a feast, as was customary for young men. Now the word here that is translated feast is the Hebrew word mishta, which very literally means an occasion for drinking. So you know what he does? Like very literally, he just throws a kegger. He's like, I'm excited. Let's get all the boys together. Let's have a party. And that's what he does. He gets all this together and he, says, he just starts to drink. And here we find he's broken all three things. He says, man, I can drink. I can handle it. I know my limits. And over and over again with strong men, our pride makes us weak. I've got this. I don't need any help. Man, God has given you great potential to do things for his name over and over again. But we say, you know what? I want it. I deserve it. I can handle this. Nothing can stop me. I'll still, it's not going to stop me from getting to God. I can handle it. So many of us You've seen men fall. I can handle just one drink. You see lives fall apart because they can't. Man, I can take just one hit. I'm not an addict. And the opioid crisis is larger and crazier than it's ever been. Or we say, man, I need, I want that new car. I deserve it. I work really hard. I deserve it. I can handle the payments. And before long, we're swimming in debt. We can barely keep our head afloat. Or we say, you know what? I deserve her. My wife never talks to me. She doesn't keep up with me like she used to. I can handle this. And before you know it, your marriage is falling apart. 
I want to show you just a little bit in week three, what we're going to see is the strongest man that had ever lived. And we'll see him with his eyes gouged out. Just dark sockets. We'll see him bound with his prized haircut. And we'll see him in the Colosseum in front of 3,000 of his enemies. He will be the object of their entertainment. A laughing stock. And see, that's what lust and entitlement and pride will do to a man. And you might say, well, well, brother, are you trying to tell me that that's what's going to happen to me? That I'm going to have my eyes gouged out? No. What I'm telling you is it could be much worse. And it might not come to you now. And it might not happen today. It could be 10 or 20 or 30 years from now. But you'll look back and you'll see where your pride and your entitlement and your lust has ruined everything. And there may come a day where your children won't even speak to you anymore. All because we handled things inappropriate. There may come a day when all the stuff that you sought after, that you worked so hard for, is laid to waste. There may be a time when your private life and the things that you can handle and the things that you know you've got this, I deserve it. There may be a day when your private life is made public and everything that you thought you had control over, everything that you thought you knew, everything that you could handle is laid out for everyone to see. And all of a sudden, the life that you lived and the life that you worked so hard for begins to crumble. But we say, we've got it. I can handle it. But what I want you to know is it doesn't have to go down that road. You don't have to lose everything that you have. It doesn't have to go that way. If you're a Christ follower, I want you to know that there is great spiritual potential inside of you. There is a potential in you to do great things. And I want you to know that no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done, no matter what you're hiding right now, you can still be great. You can still make a difference in this world. You can still be the man of courage, a man of spiritual strength. You can still defend the defenseless. Even if you never have been, you can still be a godly husband, a godly father. If you will stop trying to be strong in your own strength. Because here's the thing. Satan likes to make strong men weak. It is his goal to make strong men weak. But our God loves to make weak men strong. And our God is with you. And our God is for you. And we serve a God who when a man will be real and say, I'm weak and I need you. I can't do this alone. That God specializes in making weak men strong. See, Satan wants to take you out. He wants to make you weak. He wants to shame you in front of all your peers and discredit you. And make you waste your God-given potential on stupid stuff that doesn't matter. Like a handful of honey. 
But our God wants to lift you and use you for his glory. And there's attitudes that make strong men weak when we say, I want it. I deserve it. I can handle it. But on the other side of that, there are three attitudes that make weak men strong. If you're taking notes, you might want to write this down because everyone knows that God loves a note taker, right? The first attribute is this, not I want it, but I want God. I need God's strength. I want his daily power. I want his word living inside of my spirit. I want him ordering my steps. I want his voice directing me. And you know, the world will tell you religion and God is just a crutch for the weak. And I say that's exactly right. I'm so weak. And the only way that I can get through it was with his strength. So you say, I want God. And the second thing that you said, if I deserve it, is I deserve death. See, we deserve nothing. For being honest, we deserve nothing. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. We don't deserve anything. And we say, God, you owe me He doesn't owe us a thing. Just the fact that we're breathing is a miraculous thing. And once we realize that we are dead in our transgressions, but Jesus in his goodness, while we were still sinners, sent Christ to die for us. And we humble ourselves before a holy God and say, I don't deserve this. And we say, I don't have to serve you, but we want to serve you. It begins to make us stronger. And when every strong man says, I can handle it, A weak man seeking God's strength says, I can't handle it without God. If the worship team would come. See, if you're a weak man and you're looking for God's strength, you say, I can't handle anything without God. Without God, I am capable of nothing. Without God, I realize that I can't do this. Will you stand with me? I realize that that some of you here, men, you've been leading your families well for years. But I also know that some of us, we need a little help. We've been going to work. We've been doing the things we need to do there. But when we come home... We just sit back and allow things to go whatever way they choose to go. I certainly believe that what this world needs more than anything are fathers leading their children. Fathers leading their households. Turning our country and our families back to God one family at a time. And I want you to know this morning that there's something in your life that you've been hiding away, that you think that you can handle. You may have it right now, but there will come a day that it will all be laid wide open. It's time to realize that it's not a weakness to ask for help. But it's not a weakness to say, God, I need you. To turn to someone and say, I need your help. I need you to stand beside me. If 
we want to change the future, lead your kids to Jesus. Here in a moment, I'm going to pray. The worship team is going to play. I want to give you an opportunity this morning. If you're with us this morning, first and foremost, and you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, then I want to give you that opportunity this morning. You can come and you can meet me here and we will pray. And if you want, we can baptize you here this morning. And secondly, men, maybe you're starting to realize that you need to step up your game. You're standing there and you're realizing, hey man, I've not been doing this right. I want you to know is that right now there are people here that will pray with you. The prayer team will be over here in just a moment. I'm here to pray with you. And you say, well, if I step out of my seats, people will think that I'm not leading my family right. And they will, they'll know that I'm weak and I'm not doing the right thing. Let me tell you that that first step this morning is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength. It says, I will depend upon God for everything. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for today. Father, I thank you for the blessings that you pour out upon our lives. And this morning, Jesus, I just ask that you would move our hearts. Father, I pray for those, those men here who, who haven't been leading their families correctly. Lord, I pray that you would help us. Give us strength. Lord, allow us to depend upon you. Allow us to realize that it isn't weakness to ask for help. And Father, I pray for those of us here that have something that they've been hiding in the dark corners of their soul, in the quiet times. Lord, I pray that you would help them to give those up before it lays their white life to waste. Lord, this morning I pray that in this place that you will raise up godly men who lead their families, who lead their workplaces, who say, you know what? I, with God's help, am above what this country calls normal. Lord, help us to be a catalyst to change in our city, in our county, in our state. Lord, let it start here. Lord, we thank you, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.